Welcome to Financial Health Channel. This post is in a very different format. It is a very short story depicting an employee's working day. As he is going through his day, he is sharing some of his thoughts about our social and economic structure. Who are we, consumer, employee, and how do we become an active agent from passive agent for change? What is the status of our work alienation? He is giving us a very different outlook, thanks to the lecture on sociologist Michel Kluskart that he attended. The alarm sounded in the thick of the morning. A tentacular arm emerged from beneath the foam of the sheets. My numb hand opened the cover of the phone and pressed the alarm stop. I waited a moment, lying down, to collect the energy necessary to propel me out of bed. After a brief countdown, I wobbled from my shooting range. What a night! I had been walking in the forest. I only remembered bits, flashes. I had run after someone or something. But I also felt scared, stalked, what a night. This made no sense. I got up slowly so as not to disturb my darling who was sleeping on the other side of the bed. She was breathing peacefully. Her peace gave me deep joy. Lighthearted, I opened the door to go to the kitchen. It was still dark. A few spirits were still sitting at the table finishing their drinks before being dispersed by the light from the ceiling light. I turned on the toaster and the kettle. I put two cups on the counter next to the kettle. A slice of brioche bread went from the fridge to the toaster. A few grains of instant coffee fell singing into the cups. The peanut butter jar was near the plate. I left everything to go get a clean shirt for the day. I slid the closet door to the right. As usual, the shirt I chose was held firmly in the hanger's claws. After a few good shakes, it let go. I walked towards the bedroom. Her peaceful breathing guided my steps towards the bathroom. I closed the door and turned on the mirror. I got ready. I used the mango shaving cream. My darling had found it at the local supermarket. It was apparently organic. Was the tube also made of bioplastic? My razor was petroleum plastic. Did these companies think of all these compromises for us? Was their marketing, advertising campaign done under a veneer of concern about the ecological impact of their activity? I got dressed. I left the room. I put water in the cups. The scent of coffee came to cajole my pessimism. I put a few drops of a milk acidity in my bitterness coffee and a dose of vanilla flavored cream to welcome the morning. I took the slice of brioche bread from the toaster. I put it on the plate. I took a spatula at the end of which I put a small amount of peanut butter. I spread it on the crisp, warm bread. I bit down as I bit off one of the corners of the toast. My ritual to greet the sunrise and the setting of the moon. Yes, everything was good that way. For a few seconds I thought I existed to make the sunrise and the moon set. What would the world do without me? I paraded down the hall to bring coffee and toast to my queen of the night. As soon as I put the cup and plate on the dresser, she opened one eye, thank you darling. I kissed her and left. Good day, I took my bag. My darling had prepared my breakfast and my lunch. I preferred her cooked meals to the high fat, expensive and not very nutritious food from the diners that were in the vicinity of the factory. It was cold this morning. I liked our car. We bought it in 2018. It was a pretty red. I always joke referring to it as our Ferrari. A red that we pay dearly for every month. We had bought it in a mixture of need and emotion. I sat down at the wheel. I made the necessary adjustments for a pleasant drive. I thought of my colleagues who had bought a car that had nothing to do with their needs but satisfied their desires. They were wrong. Although I wondered if it was really their fault after all? Aren't we victimized to some degree by advertising that manipulates our impulses, desires? Slowly I pulled out of my parking space. I joined the main street. Once in traffic, work concerns came to the fore. I went over what we needed to do for today's production. We had had trouble the other day with one of the machines. 
The quality of the parts was inferior, while the settings were the same as before and those of the other machines. We were supposed to meet with the production quality engineers this morning. I hoped they would be able to find a solution. The whole team was working hard to get the bonus if we were able to meet the production goals. We were our own bosses in a way. I was distracted for a moment by a billboard about a red car. Not bad. Suddenly a strange emotion seized me. Very weird. Maybe not an emotion, but a feeling of splitting, how strange. I saw that I was almost arriving at the industrial park. A park, as if we were going to an amusement park. I parked. The colleagues were heading for the door where the scanner was. I put my hand on the screen to swear to submit for the next 12 hours to the authority of my employer. I felt the scanner's green light licking my palm and fingers all the way to their tip. A cold shiver ran through my whole body. Flashes of my dream appeared furtively, in the forest, pursued. My colleague behind me impatiently, move on. I followed the rest of my colleagues to the locker room. I opened my locker. I took my green uniform with orange stripes on the left sleeve. I noticed the multitude of colors of the uniforms. I thought back to what my grandfather, my father said to me when they worked at the factory. Everyone wore the same blue overalls. There was cohesion through color. We were a block, a social monolith. Now, that blue had been burst into multiple colors. This esprit de corps was diluted in the division of tasks, the execution of which was our individual responsibility. We were our own workshop, governed by our rule. Gradually the colleagues dispersed through the factory according to their color. We were M&M, all colorful and hard on the outside, reminiscent of the rigidity, firmness, authority, exactness in the execution of production and the soft interior of permissiveness giving free rein to our consumer desires. Is that why I love M&M so much? Am I cannibalizing myself? Simon, my colleague working at the station near mine, called me out. Hey, wake up. You are just staring at your screen. Let's prepare everything and go to the meeting with the engineering team. We met the production colleagues and the engineers in the conference room. Some young, some older. I already knew them all, except for one new one. A man of Indian origin, maybe. He seemed to be in his 30s. He was tall, slender and athletic. His hair was black like his eyebrows accentuating his long eyelashes. His high cheekbones contrasted with the wave of his mid-length hair. Definitely not an engineer. His hands were smooth from an absence of hard labor. His fingernails were perfect and polished. Varnished like his black shoes. He wore a navy suit hiding the bulges of his wallet and phone. A made-to-measure that covered a crisp white starched shirt. The rounded collar was held in place by a blue tie studded with gold buttons. His wrist was enhanced with a thick and shiny metal watch. He was cordial with everyone. He listened attentively to his interlocutors. His face was smiling while showing empathy to everyone's little worries. He reminded me of a politician working the crowd. I welcomed him. The chief engineer motioned everyone to sit down. He began by introducing the newcomer, Mr. Singh will be with us over the next few weeks on his mission. He is here as a consultant to share his expertise on workflow density. Mr. Singh stood up and in perfect French with an English accent introduced himself. He was here to observe and report back with recommendations to the board. Brief, polite, concise, he sat down again in a rustle of luxury. He peeled back the soft, thick leather cover of his iPad to take notes. The chief engineer gave a report of the situation and what were the new settings with which we had to program our machines. A few questions were asked. The meeting was adjourned. Everyone stood up. Mr. Singh chatted with the engineers, exchanging pleasantries. He took a pen from his inside pocket to write some information on a business card. The black, round, thick pen with a white star on the cap didn't work. He asked his interlocutor for a pen, who obliged. He looked around and saw a trash can. 
He threw his pen into it, which made a big clonk as it hit the bottom of the basket. I wondered why not have changed the cartridge. This clonk continued to resound, gaining momentum as it drilled through the layers of my family virtues, restraint, work, effort, discipline, hoarding, functionality of purchases. This clonk was the echo of the blow of the hammer sealing the coffin of the patriarch, blows of the deadly relentlessness of the new bourgeoisie to ensure its advent. It demonstrated its superiority, its ease, its belonging to the class of the privileged by its waste, the finality of its desire satisfied by its garbage. I was surprised by the violence of my resentment. After all, wasn't I trying to do the same? Did my resentment come from not being able to do the same or because my way of life put me at odds with myself? Simon nudged me with his shoulder, so what are you looking at? Nothing. Come on, it's time to produce to reach our quota. If we push ourselves, the whole team will be eligible for the bonus. I am a M&M. &M. Our workshops were in full swing. I focused on the precision and efficiency of my movements. I stepped aside to make way for the foreman. I disappeared into the barking of his orders. Their cadence silenced me, preventing me from catching my breath. Panting, I succumbed to my oppression. Suddenly, an alarm sounded indicating the lunch break. Between resurrected and zombie I found myself. I walked towards the light of the dining hall. I saw it as an operating room where life-saving brain surgery was done on a daily basis. My darling's food was the miraculous drug that completed my healing in record time, before the alarm sounded again. During the break, I exchanged small talk with colleagues. Most were on their cell phones. They were watching, listening to news, checking their messages. Most entertained themselves by watching videos on different social networks. They responded by making self-portraits for a solitary fame. Groups were formed to share, exchange funny, extraordinary and viral videos. They shared their reaction immediately. These communication tools could have been used to access useful information, to deepen our knowledge, to expose ourselves to new ideas, cultures. But no, social networks programmed their platforms to reinforce the tribal anxiety of individuals. We are pushed from concentric circle to concentric circles towards the center of which the absence of salvation devours with an ever more insatiable appetite what remains to us of consciousness. Dazed, we spend our existence in playful activities, the purpose of our consumption, to amuse ourselves to forget our finitude. I looked at them, tapping their fingers on the screen, clonk, clonk, in this they joined the privileged class. The alarm sounds. Everyone stood up with a crash of chairs and scattered across the factory again. It was the end of the day. Simon invited me to a trade union meeting. It was not really official, it was more a meeting between colleagues. I accepted his invitation. We went to the locker room, we changed. We put away our oppressor skin for the night and put on that of the consumer. We met in the back room of a dinner. It was well filled. My colleagues ordered a beer, I took a Perrier. They laughed at me nicely. I appreciated their simple and frank humor. Chris, one of the shop stewards, asked us what we thought of the meeting with the engineering team. They all joked that engineers only get their fingers stuck when they try their hand at machines. Chris continued, I like them a lot, because without them we wouldn't be able to meet our production goal for the bonus. They are able to show us how to achieve a better cost of production quality. The others, yeah, yeah, we like them, come on. Even the new one, there, who was with them, the Indian there. Chris, yes, by the way, what did you think of him coming to our meeting? I was told that he was also at meetings with other groups and production departments. I wonder why he was asked to come. He said it himself, to observe, to report with recommendations for the board of directors. Okay, but generally speaking these consultants are a bad omen. Why? These consultancy common companies have only two purposes. Make presentations for the board of directors and recommendations that the CEO does not have the courage to make himself, 
reduction of working hours, relocation of production, reduction in salary, laying off. Do you think he is here for that? His presence is not insignificant, this is generally a precursor of substantial changes within the company. He looked at me, what do you think? Indeed, he was not wrong. How long does it take for the first announcements from management? It depends on the complexity of what they are trying to do. I would like them to let us know in advance what they would like to do to have a constructive exchange, but they prefer to communicate with the government to ensure the success of their plan. The union is a kind of valve to channel the pressure and get it out of the system? Yes, if we weren't here, everything would blow. I see, it's a well-oiled system. The union works in collaboration with the government and the big capital in a way. Oh no, no way. We do not represent the big capital and the government. We are the voice of the workers. We fight for the freedom of the working masses. Your analysis is anti-libertarian. I see. Poor devil. He believes it. We are all part of the same system. As long as leaders are in denial, they will never be able to evolve and move society towards social gains that would make it fairer. They will never be able to resolve the apparent contradiction of the state intervention for better social gains for a greater individual freedom. And yet, the public protection of individuals, of consumers against the abuses of the big capital is the solution to this contradiction. It was already late. We said our goodbye. I went out with Simon. He took out the keys to his car. He pushed a button and the headlights came on. Well, well, he bought a new car. It was a coupe, sport, black with aggressive lines. I was surprised by his choice, knowing that he had two children. It was not really a family car. What do you think of my wheels? Not bad, huh? It's electric. I drive green, but with panache. Ecologic? How can a two-ton car be good for the environment? What about battery toxicity? Yes, it does not use gasoline, the maintenance cost is lower, but to say that it is, Ecola, I cannot take the plunge. Not bad. How much did you get it for? Too expensive. But the financing was very flexible, a six-year loan at 14%. I had knots in my stomach. I tried to be happy for him. I dared not ask him how much his monthly payment was. What's the point? I already knew what was coming up. Inflation would continue to rise. His new payment would weigh more and more heavily on his budget. He only had a few months of savings in his checking account. If the factory began to reduce working hours, this payment would be impossible to make. As the economic situation deteriorated, his car would depreciate faster. He would return the car to the dealership. He would have to pay the difference between the amount of the loan and the value of the car, or not in the worst case. His credit would be damaged for several years. This would prevent him from accessing the rare opportunities that might arise to improve his financial situation. You'll have to try it one of these days. We will do the 0 to 60 test. You will be glued to your seat. I smile. He was a big kid. We are big kids. Capitalism sells us desire. It keeps us in a playful state. Endless play is the purpose of our consumption. Access to these games defines the structure of our society. It is divided into several classes. Those who can play and who go from game to game because they can afford the cost of their waste, which is the mark of their stature. Those who play on credit and can't afford it. And those who don't play, but would like to. The latter are more and more numerous because of a purchasing power which is reduced to an increasingly thin skin of chagrin. They have become a new market for the big capital, the market of fear. Instead of addressing the problems born of the market of desire, the very foundation of our liberal libertarian society, big business pits us against each other to prevent us from holding them accountable. Awesome. Play and be scared is the debilitating leitmotif imposed on us to prevent us from returning to existence by engaging our consciousnesses in the dynamics of the dialectic. Come on, move on. Think of something else, there's nothing to see. Simon pats me on the shoulder. Come on, I have to go. 
see you tomorrow, he pulled out of his parking space and drove off, slicing through the night that was falling in an electric ripple. Quickly the rear red eyes disappeared behind some bushes. I went to my car. I started. I called my darling to tell her I was on my way, I'll be there in a few minutes. She told me see you later and to be careful on the road. We kissed one last time. A ritual that has brought us luck so far. No incidents, major accidents that would have put us in litigation with our financial precariousness. I thought back to today. What a special day. My dream or nightmare had never accompanied me throughout a day. I didn't know I had so much being in me. The beast, the hunter, the boss, the foreman, the producer, the consumer, the worker and who else. I was eager to meet the others. It was no longer a duplication, it was schizophrenia galore. A reality so rich that this allowed me to see the hunting scene from the outside. We should no longer just be the hunted and the hunter. We should also be the one who shapes, changes, modifies the social landscape, our environment. I heard on the radio strikers, union representatives talking about revolution. They still haven't realized that their libertarian ideal had long since gotten on the steady heady train of the revolutionary capitalism. We are an integral part of the convoy. So much so that any social action has become a societal delicacy, tourists are enjoying it. I found myself thinking that to change our social landscape, we should take the initiative in the institutions that govern the relationship between companies and consumers. Do activism to inject democracy into these machines, these private, semi-private institutions operating in the shadow of the corridors of power fund politicians who could influence the reorganization of these agencies in favor of consumer citizens. Then big capital will have to reconsider our sacrifice for the benefit of their illusory survival. Indeed, if the haves tense up too much on their privileges, the masses being fiscally and socially abused will roll their heads to put them on the tips of their forks. Our train can avoid its self-destruction if we play together while refusing to be afraid of each other. I arrived home. I parked the Ferrari. I opened the trunk. I took my bag. I clicked the remote to close the car. I was James Bond. Anything amused me. 007 opened the door. I called my darling. We kissed. I told her how the mission went today. She told me about her day, laughing at the surrealist dialogues that she had with her patient. I prepared as the high priest our liturgical snack for the rising of the moon. Tonight I will walk in majesty through my dreams and nightmares. Good evening.